Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. <clears throat> After this next song, we led in our opening prayer. Break thou the bread of life, dear Lord, to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Be on the sacred page, I seek thee, For the old living word, bless thou the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me, as thou didst bless the bread by my all in all. <coughs> Shall we pray together? Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you that you allow us to gather here tonight and allow us to continue to praise you and thank you for all the wonderful blessings that you bestow upon each one of us. We know that without you, we would not have all the wonderful blessings that we live with each and every day. We ask you tonight that you will be with us as we worship you. We pray that you will open our hearts and help us take in your word so we can grow stronger and better able to serve you. We also ask that you be with those of our family that are struggling physically. We have several and some are in the hospital and they're trying to find the causes of what's giving them their physical problems. We pray that you will help the doctors, help them recover, that you will wrap your arms around their family and uplift them. Lord, we are most thankful for that love that you share with us each and every day and for the love that you showed each and every one of us when you gave your son for our sins and we are so thankful that you led us enough to help us be part of your family even though we're so undeserving we ask you now to be with us as we continue in our worship service to you and continue to be thankful for all that you give us and especially for this family here at Baker Heights and we pray that you will guide us and help us grow and help us continue to be strong in sharing your will. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above, Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Following our next song, we'll have our scripture reading and our sermon. And if it's convenient for you, would you please stand as we sing? <clears throat> How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thy word, the choicest rules in parts to keep the conscience clean, to keep the conscience clean. Tis like the sun, a heavenly light that guides us all the day. And through the dangers of the night, a lamp to lead our way, a lamp to lead our way. Thy word is everlasting truth, how pure is every page. That holy book shall guide our youth and well support our age. And well support our age. Please be seated. From Genesis chapter 1, the first eight verses. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the face, the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning, 
the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And then in Genesis chapter 4 and verse 16. So Cain went out. Excuse me one second. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. When human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of humans were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever, for they are mortal. Their days will be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of humans and had children by them. They were the heroes of old, men of renown. Not working yet, is it? Is it working all right? Okay, great. Very good. We are beginning this evening our series, Asking Honest Questions and Seeking Biblical Answers. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't filled out a, a card back there, and you've got an honest Bible question, an honest question has to do with the Bible, uh, put it in there, not to stump the preacher again, or not to, to hope that the preacher is going to, a pound on your soapbox for a while. That probably won't happen. But uh, I'm enjoying these studies, and tonight we're not going to get through all three of those scriptures that you saw, but we'll try to get the first two of them. You will need your Bible, however. Uh, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 1, as you saw that. Genesis chapter 1. All of us know Robert Dennis. And his ability to give answers to questions that are not always comprehensible, uh, comprehensible, not the answers that you would always expect. He would ask me several times in the first years that I was at Baker Heights, I'd walk in the door and he'd say, what up? And I'd say, the Lord. To which he would reply, no, no, the Lord is everywhere. A typical Robert response. Uh, which you have probably heard. And so I just decided I would figure out another answer to that question. And my answer became the ethereal sky. It's up there. That's what we want to begin talking about tonight. I didn't want to be outdone. Of course, with Robert, you're always outdone because he's got another answer uh, in, un, up his sleeve somewhere. If you noticed in that reading tonight... Uh, in verse 6 of Genesis chapter 1, and God said, let there be a vault. I don't know what you think of when you think of a vault, but I think of driving down south first, and you know, there used to be an old bank there on a corner, and the bank was gone. When we first moved here, the bank was gone. Still there, the vault is. The bank's gone the basement is cleared out, but there's that one little pedestal with a vault setting on top of it and an iron door. That's what I think of when I think of a vault. But basically, what it means is, or this, you know, some of your translations may say a dome was up there, uh, an arched sky or a firmament. And one of our questions that came up in the, in the uh, box a couple of weeks ago was, what about the firmament because ever since that was written well I can't say that I can go back two or three two thousand years probably uh, there has been a question about that word vault you see a lot of Bible critics have seen that and read that and said aha there you go I'm telling you I've been telling you all along that Bible is is not anything from God didn't know what he's talking about. There's not a vault up there. Uh, 
And so we want to look at that a little bit tonight. Most, if not all, of the ancient cultures believed that there was a solid vault up there. Of course, they also believed that the earth was flat and that there was a vault, a solid one, and we were like in a, a little container down here. Uh, and that's been a problem for many, many years. Unfortunately, vault or firmament both kind of can give us, or dome can give us the wrong impression. I want us to share a few thoughts tonight about that, what I think about it anyway. You have to remember that the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew. And Hebrew is not, and I don't mean this bad in any way, Hebrew is not a complicated language. It's hard to learn, uh, but it's not a complicated language. There are not long lists of vocabulary like we have in English or German or French or something like that. They have a very, basically a limited or basic vocabulary. Uh, and I want you to imagine when Moses first wrote that, and we are going from that standpoint that Moses wrote the first five books down as God directed him. I want you to imagine that that was originally written in ancient Hebrew, a very primitive language back then, and they were living in a world that they struggled to understand. I only have to think about some of the descriptions that John the Apostle gave in Revelation, trying to describe what he doesn't really know what he's describing. He's doing the best he can with the vocabulary and the knowledge that he has. The Hebrew word that is translated here, vault or dome or expanse or firmament, is the Hebrew word rakia. And you need to remember that for the final. Uh, we'll come back to its meaning in a little bit, in a few minutes. But I want us to jump ahead a little bit from the time when Moses first wrote Genesis to the third century B.C. Okay, we're talking about... Uh, 280, I don't remember the exact dates, 250 to 280 uh, B.C., before Christ, okay? There was an Egyptian pharaoh at that time who commissioned 70, he looked, he had a guy go out and look for 70 Jewish scholars, and he brought them there, uh, and they were to translate those Hebrew scriptures into Greek, okay? Okay? And it's a good for Koine Greek. Koine Greek is the language that the New Testament was written in originally. And they were going to supposedly, originally going to translate that in 72 days. Well, they, of course, that didn't work very well. Uh, 72 guys trying to work together for 72 days on something as enormous as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture. And the reasoning for that was, among other things, that most of the Greek, and most of the Hebrews, the Jews, at that time were already living in different places. They had scattered at different times. There were a lot of them in Egypt, a lot of them, thousands in Egypt. Uh, and they did not speak, and if they spoke, they did not read typically or write in ancient Hebrew. They just didn't. They needed something. They needed their scriptures in a language, the language of the day, okay? And so that was the purpose, one of the purposes for what we call the Septuagint. Uh, they needed a Bible, and that was a noble effort. But for some reason, I went back and checked this. I've got a copy of the Septuagint in my office. Uh, for some reason, the translators chose to go to Genesis chapter 1, and where that word rakia is found, they decided to translate it with the Greek word uh, stereoma, which means firm, something made firm or thick, basis, a foundation, a solid body, a support. That's the word that they used. Uh, actually, we get our word stereo from that, but that's another story. And one can see where it's very possible that even in that third century BC that these translators may have been influenced by all of the ideas and thoughts that were floating around all of those cultures in those days uh, with the idea that, yes, there is a solid dome up there. 
And we're going to translate that word rakia with the Greek word stereoma, uh, which means basically that something firm, thick, foundation, a solid support body. Well, let's jump ahead 600 more years or more. In the 4th century, at the end of the 4th century, right at the change into the 5th century, Jerome, you've heard that name before, Jerome uh, took on a noble task as well to translate uh, into Latin, the Bible into Latin. Okay, that was the language then that was spoken in most of his circle. And so he took that Septuagint and he translated it into Latin. Well, guess what word he used to translate stereoma? He translated it with the word firmamentum. That's where the word firmament came from that is used in the King James. It came from Jerome's translation of, we call it the Vulgate, the Vulgata, uh, the Vulgate Latin translation of the scripture. Interesting, and maybe a little bit confusing. Firmament means a solid structure, something solid, and that is confusing. Well, okay, let's go back. Let's go back and look at that word rakia and see if we can find something to help us understand. As I said before, the Hebrew language is pretty limited. And imagine that the author of Genesis, Moses, used only terms that were available in his language to describe a natural phenomenon like the atmosphere, the sky, and what's beyond that. Uh, and this idea that God separated water from water, water on the surface with water, vapor water in the, in the sky, in the atmosphere, and he separated those with a vault, a, a space, something like that, a rakia. Uh, interesting. He didn't offer anything as far as an explanation or a description of that other than the vaguest most minimal description uh, that he could give and left pretty much everything else unsaid. God put a vault in the sky. God put a rakia in the sky. And so it's easy to see that uh, that could be misinterpreted and taken in different directions, especially due to the cultures that were surrounding the Hebrews during that time. It says nothing more, basically, than God created the sky and its constituent elements, I'm quoting, while remaining completely silent about what those elements were. They wouldn't have understood it. We don't understand it completely. But interestingly enough, that's the way it was. Let's look at it this way. God, use, using an inspired penman, Moses, under the constraints of, of human language, didn't make a mistake in Genesis using the word rakia. Uh, and I'm quoting again, the cosmetolo cosmology, the origin of the universe, has been kept so basic that you'd have to force certain meanings into the text and analyze what the writer must have been thinking, as well as pay no attention to the fact that God, not man, is the ultimate author of the text in order to find error. Well, what does that word rakia actually mean? It's an interesting word. It means basically to beat out. The verb from which the noun rakia comes means to beat out or stretch or beat like beating metal into thin plates. That's the example that, that uh, the dictionary will use for that. Beating out metal into thin plates for some purpose. Uh, but it also refers to something that's been stretched out or beaten out and looking at it that way God stretched out a barrier that separated the water on the surface the liquid water from the gaseous water in the atmosphere that's what a rakia is he stretched it out a couple of passages that I thought were very interesting Isaiah chapter 40 verse 22 he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy. 
and spreads them out like a tent to live in. For me, that just put a, a bow on the whole thing. Uh, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Isaiah 34, 4. All the stars in the sky will be dissolved and the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. Again, you see how he's using terminology that they would understand to describe something that they could never grasp, that we can never grasp. Uh, very interesting. The, the pictures that could be understood by the people of the day. Well, to conclude all of that, the word here, vault, is confusing. But what kind of gives us the answer is verse 8, God called the vault sky. All that the vault is, is that space that separates the liquid water from the vapor water in the atmosphere. The place where we live, the air that we breathe, the sky. Very good. And I have a list of, I don't know, probably 10 or 12 sources that I consulted for that, studying last week. It's very dangerous, these, these topics like this, <laughs> because you start down a rabbit hole, and you end up, wow, that's interesting. And so you go this direction, and you find something else, and you go this direction. And it'll take up a lot of your time if you're not careful. Afterwards, if you've got questions, further questions about firmament, uh, I'd be more than happy to take those questions in private. The second one we wanted to look at tonight is in chapter 4. You recall what happened. There was the fall of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare him a son. Uh, his name, they called him Cain. And she said, chapter 4, verse 1, with the help of the Lord, I've brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Just a side note, uh, some Hebrew, a lot of Hebrew scholars think that because of the way this is constructed in the original in Hebrew, that they were twins. Okay? Cain and Abel may have been twins. That Cain was born first and Abel later. But we, we can't really prove that. Well, let's take a journey to the land of Nod. Or you could entitle this section, Where Did Those People Come From Anyway? The People of Nod. I remember one Wednesday evening, summer Wednesday evening in Lubbock, Texas, probably, oh, I even hate to say it, may have been 35 years ago, uh, and I decided I would wander down to the local denomination to their Bible study. I was by myself, I think, and uh, I went around the block and down the street, and I walked in, obviously it was, I was a stranger, no, nobody greeted me, the place was packed, uh, nobody greeted me, I sat on the back row, didn't want to be conspicuous, and as their session, or whatever you want to call it, began, uh, there were some very uncomfortable things for me, you know, the, the, the music with the band up front, I didn't care for that, and the prayer where everybody stood up at the same time and prayed out loud at the top of their lung, uh, prayed their own prayers. Uh, and that was a little confusing. And then they all sat down, and the pastor got up, and he went to the front. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, well, let's see. What do we want to study tonight? And I thought, oh, you have got to be kidding me. What do we want to study tonight? And then he said, I've got an idea. Let's just start from the beginning. Where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> oh boy, this is going to be real encouraging and uplifting. Uh, I was more than unimpressed as I left their meeting that evening. But that question has come up again and again and again. If there's only uh, Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel, well, after Cain killed Abel, he'd already eliminated 25% of the earth's population. What are we going to do now? Where is he going to find a wife? And then we read this passage that he went to the land after God cursed him and put a mark on him, which, by the way, is not the color of his skin, as uh, some have been advocating for centuries most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. 
But uh, let's read the passage again. 16 and 17. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain made love to his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Cain was then building a city, and he named it after his son Enoch. So here we see that Cain goes to the land of Nod. Uh, but did he actually get his wife in the land of Nod? Does the text tell us that? It does not does not so that question is out we don't know where Cain got his wife I'm assuming he got his wife somewhere else but we're going to come to that question because for me that's the most important question here uh, what about the land of Nod and where did Cain get his wife who could Cain marry we need to look at the scripture for our answer let's look back just a little ways in chapter 2 and verse 7 just to get a feel for what's going on here then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And then we'll drop down uh, to chapter 2 and verse 21. So the Lord God, well, for man no suitable helper was found, so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh and then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is in my footnotes, Woohoo! look here. Uh, sorry, I couldn't help it. That, I just would love to have been there when he saw her uh, for the first time. Anyway, very interesting. Those two passages, we've got Adam and Eve. Back in chapter 1, to back up a little bit further, in verse 28, we see God's words to them. God blessed them. This is, he kind of in chapter 1 gives kind of a basic breakdown of, of the creation. And then he goes into detail in chapter 2 about man, creating man and woman. Chapter 1, verse 28, God blessed them. This is after he said he created mankind in his own image. Image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every creature, living creature that moves on the ground. So God created two people and told them to have lots of kids. Now, I don't have the number. You may know the number exactly as to how long Adam lived. Anybody know that right off the top of your head? 930 some years. Over 900 years, okay? And we say, well, come on, that couldn't happen. My body would never last 900 years. We're, it's God we're dealing with here. And remember 128 where he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. You've got 900 years to do it. So we can assume from that that all of those uh, people that were pre-flood who lived for long periods of time did so primarily because God allowed it so that they could be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth interesting chapter 5 I know we're skipping a little bit <clears throat> but let's not forget fill the earth up to this point we only know of Cain and Abel and Seth, who would come later. We read about him toward the end of uh, chapter 4, I think. No, I don't remember. Anyway, chapter 5. Chapter 5 and verse 4. Well, I'm going to read from verse 3. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness. There it is. And in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived eight years hundred years and had other sons and daughters there it is altogether Adam lived a total of 930 years and then he died now I want you to imagine living for 900 years I can also imagine that God uh, allowed them to have childbearing age well into their hundreds you could have a lot of kids in two or three hundred years 
Ladies, I know that's not something you want to think about. Uh, but they had multiple. That's a lot of time for additional offspring who also had uh, uh, additional offspring who also had offspring. By this time, by the time Adam died, he was probably a great, 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 great grandfather. And all of these children had grown up and had their own children. There are estimates that at the time of Cain and Abel, there may have been, uh, well, the, the lowest estimate I saw was 32,000 people on the, on the earth. Some say uh, many, many more, okay? Uh, that's, well, there's even one Jewish tradition that says Adam had 33 sons and 23 daughters. I don't know where they get that. We cannot forget, also chapter 3, verse 20, before we move on, Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. Well, let's go back to chapter 4 and look at that closely for a few minutes. Uh, after Cain killed Abel, verse 12 of chapter 4, he was declared, uh, well, that's not in verse 12, he was declared a wanderer on the earth, Chapter 4, and verse 12, a vagabond, whoever finds him would kill him. And then we read, he went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt from the land of Nod. You read that, and you think, well, there already had to have been a, a, a land of Nod. There already had to be people there. Nod means wanderer, okay? So I want you to imagine, there's another way to think about it. Moses wrote this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later. And when Moses wrote it, there was a land of Nod. Uh, I was trying to think of a, an illustration with, with my wife, Pam, but maybe it'll come to me in a few moments. When you read about it in, in Genesis 4, uh, we picture a land where a large group of people were already dwelling. Uh, but that's not necessarily the way it was. It's likely that when Moses wrote that name Nod, he was using uh, what we call a prolepsis. That's assigning something like an event or a name to a time that preceded it. Here it is. I knew I had written it down somewhere. My wife and I dated three and a half years before we got married. Well, that sounds like something we'd say every day, but she wasn't my wife while we were dating. She's my wife now, but I'm using that designation to refer to her back then. Moses did the same thing when he says the land of Nod. When he wrote it, it was the land of Nod. Uh, we see a special on television about President George Bush when he was a boy. Well, he wasn't president when he was a boy. A couple of Bible examples. John chapter 11. Uh, the Bible speaks of a woman named Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment. Well, that hadn't occurred yet. It was three months down the road at least before that occurred. And yet he used that to refer to her. Another example in Genesis 13 uh, and verse 3. Abraham went on his journey from the south as far as Bethel. Well... The name Bethel was not given to it until Jacob was there, much later. And you see what I'm talking about. Moses wrote a, the name of the land of Nod hundreds of years later, uh, or, and he was free to use it, even writing about a time before the name was actually given. Uh, the city of Enoch in the land of of Nod. Well, let's bring this all to a conclusion. God, you know, some people have thought God created other people in other places and they populated the earth at several different points at the same time. That's not what the scripture says, okay? Uh, he created Adam and Eve and they were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And I think that's, that's very plausible given what we've looked at. Scripture doesn't teach that. But here's what we can conclude. There were many of thousands of people by the same time Cain killed Abel. And it wasn't like he wiped out 25% of the earth's population by killing his brother. Uh, secondly, 
Cain would have had many women to choose from. Were they related? Yes, they were. Just accept it. Uh, we're dealing with God here, and he wants to, them to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Uh, and thirdly, nowhere do we read that Cain found his wife in the land of Nod. Well, I hope that goes a long way to, to answer the question that was given as, in regard to the land of Nod and where did Cain get his wife uh, next week. Our time's already gone next week. Lord willing, we'll continue this two-part series, Countering Old Testament Confusion. We might make it a three or four point uh, period, uh, uh, three or four part series, but next week we'll look at the one from Genesis chapter six and at least one other. I appreciate your attention. I know this is more like a Bible class kind of time, but uh, I enjoy it, and I hope that you can take something home as well. We're going to offer an invitation song now, and if you have a need, I hope that you'll express it while we sing this song together. Wash away my sin, nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Please be seated. When Larry was talking about the cosmopology, I, I was thought, thinking he was talking about cosmetology, and I got confused there for a minute, so I got to write another question back there about it. It's good to be back tonight. Uh, we have a lot of people that are out, as you well know. Um, we wanted to remind you that Joy, uh, Jesse Mullins has pancreatitis. Uh, Philip Maley is homesick with bronchitis. Uh, Roy Dixon is home from being in the hospital with possible TIA, uh, doing much better. Gary Robertson is in uh, Hendricks North for test. He's now in ICU. He has an infection. They don't know where. They're still trying to find it, undergoing a number of tests. Vicki Corville uh, is in Encompass uh, Rehab Room 125. Uh, Again, we want to remind uh, those that are interested, and we hope a number of you are interested, that tomorrow at 10 o'clock morning, uh, our Seniors in Motion will be meeting. Uh, they'll have a lunch and a meeting tomorrow, 10 a.m. The speaker will be the director from Rose Park. Tell us all about Rose Park and their services that they offer. Very informative, no doubt. 
Um, don't forget to sign up for the fourth annual Wayne Newman Chili Cook-Off, Saturday, April the 15th. Sign-up sheets are in the back. So all the announcements I have, continue to remember Jan Bauer as she uh, uh, goes into or having neurosurgery this Friday, March the 17th in Austin. Terry uh, McGaha having the biopsy on Tuesday and Janet Smith cataract surgery on Tuesday as well. Quite a few needs for our prayers, and so let's not forget that. So folks, let's uh, have a good evening. We'll have a prayer, and then we'll stand and sing our closing song. We'll be dismissed. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, so much for the blessing of this day, for the opportunity, for the fellowship that we have, for the blessing of studying your word, singing songs of praise. We pray that our faith has grown because of it. Help us never to forget, Father, how powerful and how wonderful, how majestic you really are. Father, give us a good day. Be with all of those of our church family that are ill, those that are in the hospitals, those that are facing hospitalizations or medical procedures. Father, you know who they are. Be with those that are grieving because of the loss of loved ones. Continue to watch over them with your loving care this day and the days that are ahead. Help us to be ambassadors of your message, of your love to those around us. Again, we thank you for this evening. Protect us from the evil one. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you were unable to partake of communion this morning, you can make your way to the nursery during this closing song, and, uh, and you'll be served. Let's please be standing as we sing. Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. God will take care of you through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. God will take care of you.